And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, crazy, shit, shit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, back by, un, back by popular demand, or unpopular demand, or popular demand, whichever you prefer. <laughs> the ma the master and ruler of the fr of the fragged non cinematic universe now coming along with fragged cyberpunk shortly, the one and only Wade Dyer. How are you doing today, man? Or tonight, man. in your case? No, no, no. It's uh, it's midday for me. I know this time zone is always a little bit weird coming from the land down under. <laughs> you know, I I would say that, but experience has taught me that time zones screw everybody over. Mm -hmm. Which <laughs> I find that to be a model of equality, to be honest. <laughs> you know, it's, it's it's like it's like it's like the dice gods. No matter your race, gender, ethnicity, cultural background, financial background, the dice gods hate you. <laughs> it's funny how superstitious we can get about that sort of stuff. I think any well, RPG a place for long enough, you start to uh, think they're out to get you. Um. <laughs> Well, for well, for me, I I um, I have I have firmly believed that 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 Lady Luck is out to get me ever ever since my early days playing playing XCOM or pl or playing any game with R playing any video game with RNG. <laughs> That's right. We we see that ninety five percent chance to hit, and we're like, mm, damn it. Okay, we got fifty fifty. Let's see how we go. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um. And. And plus, I've ha I've had to endure the long war mod, which which basically means play it until it broke me. Oh yeah, no, I love that mod. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. And I wish the best of luck to the fact that the guys making that mod are now making their own 4x game. Yeah, cool. Um, but with that with that in with that in mind, I I um I've I've of course seen how um how busy you how busy you've been and. It seems to it seems to be a bit um, fortuitous time timing with the with doing a cyberpunk take on the fragged system. F fortuitous or uh, carefully orchestrated? I don't know. <laughs> that's a good question. The answer is yes. Yes. No. That's right. Well, I, I can answer that question. Mm -hmm. Like for me, I've had this. Uh, so I'm working on my frag cyberpunk. Mm -hmm. I've had this idea sitting in my head. For, the, for years, you know, Fragged Empire, my sci-fi one, has always had a bit of a... Uh, it's not so much cyberpunk, but sort of like tones of it, and I've always mm. wanted to do one. Um, and I thought, you know what? I need a bit of a break. 2020 sucks. I want to do the uh, the equivalent of a one-shot for a, 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 a game creator. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing this little game, shooting it out, jumping on the bandwagon. I, I, I think this will be good. It's been floating in my head for a while, though, so it's kind of... Uh, yeah, a bit of give and take in terms of its release date. Yeah. Now, what now? Um, you, what? I know that this is an idea that's been in your head for a while, but where do you, where would you say it started? Like, where where did you get the spark to say to say, yeah, I think I'm gonna I think I'm gonna do a cyberpunk take. Um. Okay. So, in Fragged Empire, it's sort of setting this uh, post-human world. Mm -hmm. Um. We're using all these genetically engineered uh, different different species, and so it's had a very um, uh, biotech sort of a vibe to its technology. But uh, paired up with that is this idea that this came out of a human era where the humans focused almost exclusively on electronic technology, and so you had these sort of different ages which focused on different technological streams. And so I've, for very, for many years, have wanted to do a game set as sort of a prequel to the Fragged Empire setting during the the final declining years of humanity. So uh, that, that I think that's where the nugget of of the thought and the ideas and you know the settings and the rules and everything like that started to, uh, yeah, sort of play in there. And. Take, and taking that taking that into account now um I know I 
I've known you. I've known you well enough to know that you that um much like much like another much like another international brother in the temple um, Ed, you can, if you're gonna if you're gonna do a if a particular genre you're gonna put your own spin on things, mm-hmm. and if somebody is if somebody is jumping into Frag Cyberpunk from th- from um. Other sort of cyberpunk games, whether it be Shadowrun or or Cyberpunk 2020 or now Cyberpunk Red, or mm. um, or something like that, what would be what would be familiar to them when it comes to when it comes to Frag Cyberpunk, and what would be different compared compared to those other works? Okay, yeah, no, that that's a very good question. So I think um, I. I You've got all the classic cyberpunk tropes in terms of a lot of body augmentations, and you have um, uh, characters are sort of divided between their uh, like this is a, a rule sort of thing is uh, their meat and their machine mm-hmm. attributes. So their meat attributes are like body, limbs, and mind, and then their machine attributes are their data, networking, and edge. You know this idea that uh, people are sort of this blend. Um, and you know, the big dystopic mega city type stuff, you know, all that sort of stuff is a fairly heavy trope stuff, which people mm-hmm. will be very familiar with. The thing that I think that sort of sets it apart from, uh, some other cyberpunk settings wise is that it's actually a far future cyberpunk. So earth, for example, has been forgotten its location unknown. It's set, you know, tens of thousands of years into the future um and a sort of human sort of sort of are the ruins of previous human ages and um another thing that sets it apart is that the classic cyberpunk uh idea is that corporations get so powerful that they supplant governments as sort of the ruling hierarchy structure um that's not the case in this one so um in in this frag cyberpunk you actually have these different factions these different houses and clans which rule and the ruling one is called the makers and the idea is that humanity is declining it's dying out everyone's sort of getting sick and genetic defects are happening Mm -hmm. um and you know the idea that like organs are failing so it's just cheaper to replace them with synthetic organs rather than getting them fixed and these makers have access to the best technology from sort of the previous ages. And the idea is that everyone's put their faith in them to plot a path forward for humanity. Mm -hmm. And so the makers are kind of organizing humans into these big cities and they've uh, got this very totalitarian uh, sort of grip on everybody, on the the economy and... um, and they're channeling all of the resources to the makers. And the idea is the makers are going to save everybody. They're going to figure out how do we fix this disaster that everybody's heading for where humanity is going to become extinct. Um, and so it's not actually corporations that are running it. It's actually uh, these ideological, uh, very highly managed economies uh, systems are actually in charge. Um, the actual underground, like the CD, you know, uh, black markets and everything have their own sort of free market sort of systems. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, uh, the, the idea of the currency in the game is called CHITS, C-H-I-T-S, mm-hmm. and that stands for credits, information, and tech. And that's a sort of the, the, uh, the money system that everyone uses. So credits are stuff that come from the makers as, you know, it's like credits for your, your rent and your food and your, uh, your access to the internet for the month, you mm-hmm. know? Whereas if you want to get ahead, then you start dealing in information and tech and stuff like that. So, yeah, yeah hope, hopefully that, that that sounds like it's a little bit, just a slightly a bit of a, a fresh take on it. So it's not big mega corps running things. It's these big ideological, all-powerful factions mm-hmm. um, with very defined agendas and goals for where they want to take humans to. Now, anybody who knows Fragged Empire... Uh, knows that the makers aren't actually doing this. They are actually want humanity to die out, and they're the ones who create the Archons that then leads to the whole Fragged Empire history and yeah. stuff. Yeah. Now, 
something that something that I did no, that I did notice when I looked at the character sheet is it seems it seems to be um, spread out in a, in a different way compared to some of the previous um, fragged games. Um, could you go, could you go into that? Could you go into this sort of column based approach that you have with the um, skill system for Frag Cyberpunk? Uh, yeah, look, I mean, the, I don't, I don't think the character sheets are too different from my other fragged, uh, my other fragged sheets. Um, they're a little bit tighter because mm -hmm. uh, it's a slightly, you know, it's a different rule system, and I'm going for a different tone. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just your two sheets, your, your non-combat sheet and your combat sheet, sort of stuff. Um, but I have expanded the skills in this, so this mm -hmm. is a much rather than the sort of classic uh, twelve skills. I think we've got uh, eighteen skills. In, in cyberpunk mm -hmm. and i'm having a play with sort of breaking them up in different you know just di different sorts of ways these these little uh pdf only products of mine mm -hmm. are a chance to sort of experiment with some different ideas yeah um but i'm not sure how much to go into the details uh people have a look at them any experienced rpg mm -hmm. or have a look at the character sheet and they'll instantly go oh this is the sort of game it is yeah which i, I can um i can definitely i can definitely understand that and Taking taking that into account, you mentioned a, you mentioned a kind of separation between machine and meat mm. er, early on. Now, given 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 how a lot a lot of designs um, have a, have a very unified attitude, this is sort of a thing that's been that's been around for the last I don't know 20, 25 years. Um, would it be fair of me? Would it be fair of me to say that that theme of the divide between machine and meat, and where the, and where the crossover happens, is one that occurs throughout the um, throughout the throughout the system? Uh yeah. Look, that that's a really classic cyberpunk thing: is that mm -hmm. relationship between man and machine, mm -hmm. and an exploration of those themes. Like, I mean. The quintessential one for me is Ghost in a Shell. Like, I love the philosophical sort of exploration of that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the sort of games that I want people to run. And I've tried to encourage this um, in the rules as well. So, I mean, the easiest one is the idea of where people put their attributes. They'll think, okay, am I more biological or am I more, you know, technological, my nature? Um, and everybody selects a, a form. And so this form can be everything from a, uh, a a meat kebab, which is somebody who's freakily a hundred percent organic, you know. So they're they're a little bit odd, um, all the way to like cans, primes, freaks. You can also play a hologram, or if you want, you can be purely software. Um, and then the way the weapons work, you've got physical, energy, and digital. So physical obviously only affects your meat your physical nature, digital, your machine nature, whereas energy can kind of affect both at once. It's a safer but less uh, precise uh, attack method. And so the idea that having these different sorts of options, um, the goal is to sort of fuel and facilitate those sorts of uh, uh, games that explore those stories. Um, yeah. Hopefully hopefully that helps a little bit. Mm. It's, 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 yeah. Now there's a lot going on here, yeah. Yeah. Now one of the things I also one of the things I also saw was the concept of encoding, the, mm -hmm. the line between a deity, demon, and peon. What can you what can you tell me about those three um, codes when it, okay. when it comes to the setup? So uh, a big thing in the game. So I would say the holy grail of a cyberpunk game is to have an excellent sort of system or digital in, in interfacing sort of system mm -hmm. now i'm not going to claim that i've i've achieved the holy grail but this is my shot at it um and uh so so what i've done is i want everybody in the setting to be able to um interact with computers in a way but i don't just want one simple computer skill therefore everyone's just going to automatically select that skill just because given the setting, every, like everyone would be stupid not to take programming, okay? Mm -hmm. So I've actually defined, divided programming up into three different uh, types, uh, deity, demon, and peon. So uh, deity is primarily used by the ruling factions, and that deals with metadata and just bulk 
bulk amounts of data. So they're the sort of people that would get sort of uh, little bits of uh, scraps of information on millions and billions of people and then compute it into algorithms to sort of predict the future sort of stuff. Um, then you've got demon coding, and this is primarily used by the underworld, and it's a lot more to do with uh, operating systems that do to do with uh, networking and uh, quick exchanges of information and data. Um, so that's sort of get in there, do your job, and get out really quick mm -hmm. before you're noticed sort of stuff. And then peon. Peon is used by the lower classes of people. And this is a... A, a, a culture of programming and systems that has emerged out of um, basically a lot of people who can't afford software, they can't afford the updates, they can't afford regular access to like the stream, which is like the internet equivalent. Mm -hmm. And so they just do a lot of their own sort of hacking modifications, sharing different scripts and um, freeware stuff around. And it's a sort of... Um, thing that's very difficult to keep up with mm -hmm. so if you sort of stay out of the loop for a month then all of a sudden you're like massively behind you know you're going to really struggle to sort of uh interface with a lot of the sort of things that they're creating um and so people can select their which sort of a codings they're going to be familiar with and the hope is you know you might get someone who selects all three but that's a really big investment Mm -hmm. uh, the idea is that you might get different people in the party trained in different ones of those. And then when the game comes in, like when you play the game, you're sort of, okay, what sort of a system are we interfacing with? Who's got the right skill? And these different skills interact with each other in different ways. And the encoding thing on your sheet. So when, when you're making a character, you select your encoding. And this is the, this is the, the programming that you use in your own body to get all of your augmentations to work together and to interface with your brain. And so you can actually be running on a deity, a demon, or a peon-based system. Mm -hmm. And this means if people want to hack you or do things to you, they've kind of got to guess what your encoding is. Now, the classic thing is if you see, you know, a gangster, you're like, oh, he's probably going to go on demon. You know, so you, this, there's a bit of a, a cultural inform, like there's some things you can do to sort of help you inform your guesses um, as to what sort of encoding people have got. And also the type of encoding is going to slightly uh, alter a few game options that are like only available to you if, if you've selected a certain sort of coding, encoding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when, now, um, when it com when it comes to now obviously there's a lot of the familiar material that I do see within um frag cyberpunk namely namely the um long term projects ki kind of thing that has all that I think has always been a ma has always been a major motif that and um the f I'd imagine that even with this set even with this setup in fact in fact it's actually apropos here combat is still going to be on the lethal end of the spectrum uh, yeah, so I I would actually say combat in a typical fragged combat mm. is sort of dangerous but not very lethal. But in fragged cyberpunk, it's kind of toned up to be fairly lethal. Um, uh, in that guns are scary if they shoot them at you, but you know you're still like not like sort of instant death sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and different sorts of weapons will have different sort of lethalities like a bullet weapon could shoot you and then you could start to bleed and things like that but if you get hit by a digital weapon all of a sudden that could make you you know they could take you over yeah. uh override your brain and yeah turn you into a puppet which is effectively death mm -hmm. and when when it when it comes to when it comes to that sort of that sort of combat um what sort of what sort of measures are taken so so that um, something like di something like digital combat doesn't um, doesn't take too much of the show. Uh, so yeah, so, so the way that I've done it is that because of the three types of weapon, you know, the whole mm -hmm. meat energy and digital thing. Yeah, is that in the book all three are given uh, equal equal sort of space mm -hmm. in terms of the rules and the options that you've got available to you. 
But also, they, they all play a slightly different role. So uh, digital weapons are fancy, good for doing some sort of fancy, trickier stuff, whereas uh, physical weapons are good because you can just shoot more bullets in a way. So you can... Um, and then energy weapons, of course, are the reliable because they can affect anybody. But say, for example, you're in a fight. Mm -hmm. um, like a typical fight would be against people who are all a mixture of meat, meat and machine. You know, a bunch of goons. They might come with a program that, you know, that's also attacking you. Um, but um, there's also some extreme cases in that if you're in virtual reality, then you're only going to be able to use digital weapons. Now, there's going to be... Uh, programs you can buy so you can also run your physical weapons in virtual reality. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also, let's say you're in like the slum of the city and a meat kebab cult is attacking you. These guys have no plugs in their brains. Your fancy digital weapons are going to do squat to them. You know, a, 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 a nice solid rock or a big stick's going to be more effective. Um, so I still want those extreme cases. So if your party goes too heavily digital, you're going to really struggle against a couple of non-digital opponents. And with the other, th and I'm guessing that's also, I'm guessing that sort of balance is also the reason why you have two stances with in um, meat and machine. Yeah. So your your stance is your as your approach to defense, um, and so you'll be able to take like you know dodge, block, or endure sort of stances and that sort of you know do you just sort of take it or do you just try to avoid it and the different weapons are applied against those depending on what ones they are mm -hmm. now when it comes now when it comes to a lot when it comes to a lot of hacking sequences in um in a lot of cyberpunk games some sometimes there sometimes a uh, trap that i see happen often is the hack is the um, hacker effectively separated from the party while they do their actions, while the rest of the people at the table aren't able to contribute as much. Um, hmm. What steps have you taken to with the, to minimize this particular issue, if possible? Look, I I, I thought long and hard about this, and I, I realized there was this kind of the classic approach is either well there's sort of two classic approach mm -hmm. one is you make it a simple skill roll of a skill programming skill roll the dice do you succeed yay or nay okay and you know you can have sort of stories come out of the the role the other classic approach is some sort of a mini game and that that is particularly prone to the problem that you just mentioned and that the hacker then is pulled aside you go do your mini game while everyone else is just sort of waiting around twiddling their thumbs and to me as a designer, I think the ultimate way that a character can be overpowered um, is actually not necessarily statistically better, but the primary way is if a character is, is continuously getting more game time, just them. Like, I think that's, that's something I want to avoid at all costs. I will happily have uh, a slightly more powerful weapon over having that happen. And so what I've decided to do, I actually haven't done the mini game approach. I've mm -hmm. done the skill roll approach where you just roll and then a story sort of comes out of that. But then I've tried to break up the skills into multiple skills with different interactions together and sort of more of a, uh, a, um, a lore and options and sort of approach. So it's a, at some times, you know, the peon code guy might, okay, well, he goes make his roles or does his thing, but then another time the DD code guy is going to have a go. Um, and that's that's my approach. And this is, this is kind of why it's the holy grail, you know, if anybody who can solve this equation of uh, somehow doing a cool mini game that doesn't isolate a character off from the rest is, uh, it, they've got it. But I don't, I don't think that's quite achievable in a tabletop form. Yeah. <laughs> And with it now, given 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 that given that particular approach, would you would you say that um you that your set your setup when it comes to when it comes to um when it comes to um care when it comes to character setups with this, and this is something that was kind of in some was kind of in some of the previous 
um, frag games, but I'd say even more so with this one is that you is that variety is what'll keep a party alive. Yeah, yeah, I, I would say um, that this variety is required way more in frag cyberpunk than my other games. Like if you if you're going to survive, you need physical and meat characters, and you're going to need machine and digital characters. Um, you could all be boring and go sort of energy weapon characters, but that's um, that that comes with its own problems. Um, but yes, you, you want a mixed party. You, mm. You're required, definitely. Yeah. And of course, I saw, I've seen that um, this game, just as much as the previous ones, does place an emphasis on cover. And based on what you said about um, those three types of um, of, we of weapons, that still applies. Given that, uh, um, yep. um, I do have to ask: Does co does cover is cover still as effective against against digital weapons as it is against physical and energy? Uh, so you're basically going to have different types of cover. Mm -hmm. So physical cover, you know, barriers and stuff like that, that doesn't help against digital weapons at all. But then you can have like uh, EM fields and sorts of D. Uh, there are a bunch of digital sort of barriers and things like that as well. Yeah. So we. So um, would you say would you say that it's a bit of a rock paper scissors um, approach? Mm, no, I wouldn't say it's a rock paper. Oh, it's it's sort of tricky. Like, I suppose ultimately everything could be called a rock paper scissors. But I don't think it's that simplistic. Like I think it's it's very sort of you you're got, as a digital character you're still going to need to move around as much as a physical character. Um, it's just that, ah uh, oh, man, it's it's difficult to to describe. Like you're just gonna like analyze the battlefield in the same way, but it's sort of like imagine you've got two battlefields at once happening, the physical mm -hmm. battlefield and then the digital battlefield over the top of that. But then they do have some crossover in them, you know? Yeah, I gotcha. Now, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to um, Augs, which obvi obviously being a Cyberpunk game, that's going to be one of the... Um, one of one of the pri one of the primary thi one of the primary motifs. Now, given how given how the given how there's aug ties into um into skit into skills at attributes, is it is it going to work the the same way as some as some of the um, advancements like say traits in previous works? Uh, yeah, so anybody who's familiar with frags, you know, the traits, you have one trait per attribute or per trained skill. Mm -hmm. Orgs replace that. Um, so it's basically, it is traits. It just goes by the name org. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, thematically within the game, it's less to do with your skills. So say, for example, if you had like a physical skill in a classic frag game, you might take the acrobat trait, you know, um, or the, for medicine, you might take the surgeon or the pharmacist trait, and that sort of represents, you know, additional skills-wise and specialization within that area. Mm -hmm. In cyberpunk, you're then actually taking an augmentation that lines up with that. So your um, your your uh, physical finesse org might be, you know, rocket boots, or it might be uh, anti-grav wall climbing or stuff like that like it's sort of a representation of giving yourself like a special ability or some sort of technology to do with that area now when it comes when it would um would it be fair to say that there that um there's probably going to be some some augs that'll be familiar that'll be familiar to those to people who have played a frag game before, but I'm guessing that there's going to be some that are unique to frag cyberpunk. Uh, so so most of them will be unique. I would probably say, well, it's just just the nature of it. A lot of them will, but there's a there's a classic ones in there that are sort of I always seem to put in. So for example, uh, a classic trait that I always put in all my fragged games is called eye candy, mm -hmm. and that's to represent if you're an attractive looking person. Um, but in Frag Cyberpunk, I've uh, got it uh, sculpted looks, and that will mechanically seem very similar. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and I've got like the equivalent of a few traits, but have been, you know, slightly tweaked in their names to change stuff. But I would say easily most of the choices will be unique. They'll be different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, when it comes to. When it, when it, I know we already mentioned the whole trinity of physical energy and um, digital, but when it comes to. When it comes to um, weaponry, um, what. What what would somebody expect with the weaponry in here that um, might be a bit different from, say, Empire? Okay, well, Empire is very sort of, uh, you know, it's it's guns and bombs and mm -hmm. stuff like that, like SMGs and rifles and things. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in this game, you do have those sorts of weapons in the physical nature, um, but in terms of the uh, uh, adding in all of the digital ones. So, for example, um, the way that I've sort of worded them, uh, this is just me experimenting with names. I might change them. Mm -hmm. It's like different ways of like hacking into people's minds with like, uh, it's called a, a blackjack uh, system or maybe a worm system if you want to like mm -hmm. give someone a virus and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, it makes, makes sense. And... Um... When it comes to when it, when it comes to um the stances, would these would these stances be sim be similar to um ar um armor in pre in um previous fragged games? Uh, so a bit of a different. So in normal fragged frag game, uh, you don't have stances. You just sort of have your outfit, which is mm -hmm. your armor, and then your defense and stuff like that comes off your attributes. This system is actually much more like my Eternum system, which is my gothic horror game, mm -hmm. um, in that uh, your stance also defines your armor, your endurance, your defense, and your combat order, all in one option. Um, and, yeah, so I, I've sort of taken that from Frag to Eternum a little bit more. So it's not necessarily a piece of gear. It's kind of... It's more like a, a narrative thematic... Uh, descriptor of your character's approach towards self-preservation, mixture of skills, uh, your your sort of martial ability, but also could be your equipment. Mm -hmm. And when it now when it comes to now um when it comes to the long term thing, like when it comes to the um pro, when it comes to um projects that that some that someone might um undertake. Um, what part of what part of it would be what part of it would be similar and what part would be different? I'm specifically referring to um, the spare time mechanics in this. Uh, yeah, so you've got the sort of um, a classic frag thing is you, if you really want to do a long term project, you can do like research stuff and mm -hmm. that could give you access to special traits by spending special knowledge on it and things like that. Uh, frag cyberpunk. Though it it basically has that there's this there's, there's, it's multiple different ways that you can approach this um, in terms of projects that you can spend your spare time on. Mm -hmm. um, so the the primary ones is you can either your weapons and gear. Okay, you can just keep buying new gear. You can keep modifying your gear, um, buying more utility items, and and uh, or upgrading your weapons or getting more weapons so you're more prepared. Uh, the secondary method um, is your home base. You can spend time, you know, building a base and adding, you know, aesthetics or guard or security systems to it. You could turn it into a business. Mm -hmm. uh, or the third sort of classic approach, which is the big one, is orgs. So in a classic fragged game, every time you level up, you gain a trait. In fragged cyberpunk, those hard caps have actually been removed. So there is no resource system. You don't gain an org when you level up because there mm -hmm. is no leveling up. Um, all you have is you could spend your spare time points and your chits on installing orgs. And you can just get as powerful and as powerful as the as the money and the and as you as you've got. Mm -hmm. um, and that's partially to do with the, the setting. Because the setting is is trying to encourage like encourage the idea that it's really unbalanced like some people are just simply way more powerful than other people just purely because of the access to orgs that they've got 
Um, and so in this game, there isn't the maximums to attributes. You can just, every time you install an org, you also get an attribute point. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that'll be the big one. I think that everyone's sort of encouraged to be aiming towards is uh, trying to get their hands on chits so they can get more orgs. And given the, given that and the fact that you're not going with the level-based approach that you've done in the past, that bring that brings me to the question of the um of the av- of the average PC power that's used when determining um strength for e- for NPCs and encounters. You know, hen- mm-hmm. henchman group, troop group, skilled, and nemesis. Um, what me- what uh, metric would average PC power um be in that case, or is that something that's currently being worked on? No, no. So I've I've worked on this. So I'm trying a whole new unique approach to doing this. That I haven't done any other frag game. Uh, it's a system I called Power System. Mm-hmm. And what this does is it takes. Uh, so weapons all have a power rating. Mm-hmm. Uh, stances have a power rating, and you take your highest weapons power, uh, both of your stances power, and then one for each org that you've got. And you add that together and it comes up with a number. And then that informs the GM as to the idea if they wish to create a balanced encounter, scale the difficulty of your opponents according to the power of your PCs. Mm -hmm. Um, So either to the average power is sort of the recommended approach, but you could if you want to do more individualistic. Um, And... Yeah, so that, that's just kind of the approach that I'm using it there to nudge people. So so if you actually um, want to, you can actually keep your power low purposefully. You can be like, okay, well, I'm actually only going to have like a knife and a pistol um, and trying to keep my power low because that means less powerful NPCs are paying attention to me and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and it gives a different sort of a tone of gain. And... With taking taking that into account, would it be would it be fair to fair to say that um, that the whole average PC power is isn't um, isn't apply, isn't applying a a um, assumed party size? Because of course that uh, a lot of when a lot of people look at um, something like something like average power, they end they end up thinking of the whole challenge rating thing that D and D has, which does have a similar um assumption well the the, the uh, are still going by the mm-hmm. classic sort of fragged approach in mm-hmm. that sort of a skilled npc is equal to one pc a, uh, a nemesis is equal to three pcs or a henchman group which could be you know six mooks are uh, equal to one power the power of one pc so you still have the one for one in terms of the number of npcs that you're fighting um, but then each of those NPCs can grow in sort of they get more attributes or they get more uh, powerful weapons if you wish to scale them according to the power of the uh, the players. Mm-hmm. So it, it's very, um, it, in this game, like it's very much the players can, uh, like there's no caps in terms of what they can do. And if they've, you know, they just, you know, did a massive job and they're swimming in chits then that means they can shoot their power up like an equally like you know four or five points in one big shot like it's all based on their player actions not just um you know if they're clever and they get lots of money then they get rewarded by that Mm -hmm. not just the amount of time they play which is I, i kind of want to encourage greed and ambition and uh, inequality are, are major themes within the setting and just major themes within cyberpunk genre as a whole. Mm-hmm. And I want the rules to also reflect that. And take with that, with that kind of, th- with that kind of thing in mind, um, now obvi- obviously in that sort of situation, somebody could shoot up their, um, their potential power level if they meant, if they managed to luck out and survive a certain kind of job. But what would you have in mind as far as the consequence of trying to pull that kind of thing? Well, it, it's kind of the... They get the consequences in two parts. I mean, mm-hmm. one part has got to be the GM has conducted a scenario. You know, they're doing a big bank heist or something like that, or they're robbing some you know, crime crime underlord's vault 
you know, that should be suitably dangerous Mm because if you're trying to steal this amount of money from someone, that means they've got a large amount of money to to do defenses. So, you know, sort of trusting the GM to do that. Now, the GM is given advice in the book of recommended reward rates to give players, um, but those are just recommended. They can sort of alter those as they wish. Mm -hmm. Um, The other thing is actually the cost of success. And the cost of success is if you get lots of chits, um, the book says, you know, as you gain in more powerful power, more powerful NPCs will start paying attention to you. Um, and that means you'll start getting, attracting the attention of other people. They'll take note of you. You just did a big job. You've got lots of orgs installed all of a sudden. Oh, this is a bit of a mover and a shaker. Or, you know, I might try to recruit them. Or, oh, my goodness, they might be a threat. I'm going to try and take them down. Mm-hmm. Um and stuff like that like that, that that sort of narrative consequences should come in there and part of that is reflected in the power system and that the npcs should get more powerful for a recommended balanced fight yeah um and t- um with that kind of thing in mind some something else that i that i saw that i i saw in the um material in the material that i found interesting was so it was um coding some of the optional rules for 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 certain play styles, um, was and maybe maybe was that was that a means to dem- to demonstrate that this is something that can that can be done if so, if somebody wanted to go more narrative, wanted to go more crunchy, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Uh, yeah. So so this is a a, a, a sort of a um, it's you know it's not even a rules. Mm-hmm. What it actually is, so this is something I'm doing for my Frag 2nd Edition. So this Frag Cyberpunk is heavily mm-hmm. inspired by my 2nd Edition rules. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, it's not the same, but I've sort of taken a bunch out of there. Yeah. And something that I found about the Frag system is, the Frag system is really, really flexible. And it's really like a huge amount of player and GM um uh, hugely empowered in terms of the number of options that they have available to them. Um, whereas, like a level system, like in D and D, you know, everyone only gets a few options each level, and it's very handholdy mm-hmm. all the way through. Whereas in Fragged, you've got like hundreds of options from your first level, and this is a bit. This this can be a bit of an issue in that um, uh, it's kind of like dropping someone in the deep end. You know, mm-hmm. and saying go swim, you know, in the sea of potential and don't drown, you know. Um, or they just don't see the uh uh they don't see what selections they should be taking and some people just don't like much rules, okay? Mm-hmm. And so what I've tried to do is develop a system for structuring the rules in a way that informs people to help them to make better choices quicker. And what this is is I've labeled lots of the the orgs and the traits and the options and the weapons and stuff like that in in the game with little icons. Um, And these little icons are uh, keyed to different sorts of play styles. Um, So you've got rules light, little cube. Um, Mm -hmm. So if you're the sort of person who just doesn't like much crunch. So these options are much more passive bonuses. They're simpler. There's not a lot of moving parts to them. Uh, Then you've got the combo options. Um, and this is for your power gamers or your people who love maths. You know, they appreciate the gamey side of the role playing uh, experience. And so these are like good for. Uh, th- 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 there's more to them than what you might necessarily first think when you look at it, or they combo together with other options in a particularly dramatic or interesting way. Uh, the other option I've got is for narrative play. And this is for people who really love, you know, they put on the voices, they really do a big backstory, they really want to, they love the immersion. Um, And so these options are good for those sorts of uh, players or GMs who want to take these sorts of stuff. Uh, And then the fourth one is called Mix It Up. Mm -hmm. And this is an excellent choice is if you're an experienced fragged player and you just want to go an option that's pretty weird. Um, something that's either going to scrap a whole rule within the system or add in a whole new big one, or it's just going to make you interact really strangely. So in Frag Cyberpunk, an example of that might be is if you go someone who is a a piece of software. Mm -hmm. You have no physical body, 
for the whole game you have no physical body um and you've got to like piggyback inside all of your other characters and stuff like that or if you go a meat kebab which is someone without any orgs installed in their bodies like those would be examples of freaky options like mm -hmm. weird options um so those are for the you know the player who insists on going the, the really odd choice they want to stand out or be unique or they've just played the game lots and lots and lots and they want to do something different you know you want to go your your really weird option mm -hmm. so yeah ho hopefully that uh, it sort of expands on it just a way of uh, structuring the uh, the way the rules are laid out to help people make more informed and quicker choices yeah i got gotcha. you now when now um when it comes to the, when it comes to the full the full on the full on book now, as I understand it, you are going to be doing a doing a crowdfund for um for Egg Cyberpunk shortly. Yeah. Um. What? Now, with when that when that go when that goes when that goes live, how what do you expect the page count to be compared to some of the other um Cyberpunk? some of the other fragged books that you've done okay so the the current choice of them so my a classic fragged book is about 174 pages mm -hmm. um this one at the moment is sitting at 102 and so it's going to have all of the law and the rules in one book you don't mm -hmm. need to reference the fragged core rule book or anything like that mm -hmm. um and then the hope is that if we get massively funded then i'll be just i'll put more law in i won't expand the rules just because I'm just going to complete the rules until the point where I feel like they're full, mm -hmm. um, no matter how big or small that takes it. Um, and an advantage of a PDF-only product is I can do that. I could just add a page or color page. The rules will be complete no matter what. Um, but the law, like we could always add more pictures or do more write-ups. Um, yeah, so... Hopefully we get well funded, you know, we'll see how we go and uh, we'll go. Yeah. See how we go from there. So would, um, would it be, f would it be fair to say that you, that, um, with, with that crowdfund, you have no plans to do a physical version of fragged cyberpunk. This is the digital no, only no. product. Yeah, no, this is a digital only product. So this will be the, um, this will be the third time I've done this. So, uh, frag seas was mm -hmm. actually my first one, which was my pirate game. And it started off as a PDF-only product. And it actually sat in that form for probably a year and a half or two two years almost. Um, and eventually it did actually get a physical book. Like it just, and then I sort of added it, expanded it and got some artwork done and, you know, it, it became its own thing. Uh, Diesel, Fragged Diesel Punk Mecca was one I did a couple of years ago. And that was a one-week-long Kickstarter, smash it out, done. Um, and this is going to be much like that. Like, so I'm hoping to get this in people's hands complete by the end of the year. No frills, Kickstarter, PDF only. Let's go just do this thing. Um, and then, yeah. And it, it look, if it gets really successful and my development schedule and my business's budget allows it, it might turn into a physical product in the future. Um, and if it does, then, of course, I will be expanding it by adding much more pages to it. And, yeah. Uh, but it's it's just a case of don't don't count don't count um chickens before they hatch. Yeah, no, it's it, everyone should just assume this is going to be a digital only product, um, and part of that is because I'm doing this for myself. Uh, I know it's sort of like it's sort of bad business practice in a way, and then I'm mostly doing this as a bit of a passion. Sort of, I just want to do this. It's fun. I want to do something that's different. That's not super high risk i don't have to do shipping and printing and all that stuff i can just get out there and smash it out there and do something sort of a little bit experimental um and having this not be a printed book really means i just get to do what i think is cool mm -hmm. rather than necessarily having to factor in all of the business uh equip like uh business requirements of if this was a physical book um and i think that that's good for me as a creative person i need that it's good for the fragged line that allows me to experiment it's also good for the like player base because it means you get new stuff quicker and sometimes you get some edgy things and i think if there's going to be any setting 
that's good for something that's just a little bit weird, a little bit edgy, a little bit experimental. I think cyberpunk is an excellent candidate for that sort of approach. Yeah, not obviously. Um, I'll I'll be keep I'll be keeping a close eye. When when is the Kickstarter plan to go live? So the hope was to get it done by the end of the week, but it might be at the start of next week. But the plan is before the end of the month. Uh, I hope to hit the go button. The only thing that's holding me up a little bit is I. Uh, I just want to wait until I've got the page look just right, and I don't think I've quite got that yet. Um, and then once the pages are all, you know, once the book's in a really, really healthy state, and I mean darn near finished, mm -hmm. then I want to hit go on the Kickstarter. Um, and the reason for this is I want it darn near finished, so then when the Kickstarter's done and then I have to wait a week or two until the money comes through, in that period I can then finish doing my polish and my playtesting, and then just done. Send it out to people. Uh, yeah. And le like I said, I'll de I'll definitely be looking forward to seeing how how that develops. Um, with that, with all that in mind, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and braving the hell that is time zones. <laughs> um. And of course, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say oh. around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and, of and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone else who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then... On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!